So, um, it's a good place to talk about the Heisenberg picture. So, so far what we have been doing is called the Schrodinger picture in quantum mechanics. Um, so let me I'll lay things out a little bit, and then we'll talk about Heisenberg picture. So it's not really a different formulation of quantum mechanics, but uh, you can think of it as a change of basis. Okay, so what is Schrodinger picture? Uh, To show them the picture, uh, the physical states uh, evolve with time. So, in the uh, in so we'll we'll focus for the for the time being on the Hamiltonian being time independent. Okay, so for the moment, um, and what's going to happen is that because it's time independent. It's easy to evolve uh, 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 states in time. So psi of t is simply uh, the evolution operator, which can be simply written as e to the minus i h t acting on psi at the initial uh, time. Right? So physical states evolve uh, with time. That's the first thing. And uh, if the operator, if uh, A, an observable, uh, does not depend on time, in fact, it usually doesn't depend on time. For example, X, P, the spin, and, and so on. Then, of course, the eigen, eigenstates don't depend on time. Then the eigenstates, uh, the eigensystems, are, uh, is, also T independent. Okay? And so what will happen is that uh, when you take the expectation value of some uh, observable, if you're interested in how the expectation value for your system will evolve, that's what you do. Okay? Um, uh, that's the expectation value. with respect to your physical state. My physical state, let me emphasize, means that means it's the state that describes uh, your system. Okay? Um, it, it, it corresponds to uh, uh, what your system is doing at time t. Now, uh, that's shown in the picture. In the Heisenberg picture, it turns out that we do the following. We do, instead of saying that, so I should now put x sub s uh, be, 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 uh, behind every state. In fact, let me also do the following. So I'm going to write this as t minus t naught. And this is psi of t naught. Okay. So I'll explain why in a, in a second. But uh, for Heisenberg picture, um, what's going to happen is that the physical state in the Heisenberg picture does not depend on time. It's just fixed. Okay? And then what happens is that the observable, whatever operator that you use to have in the Schrodinger picture, uh, now depends on time. So now I have to put an AS. A is in the Schrodinger picture. In the Heisenberg picture, it will now depend on time, 
And in the following way, you take the Heisenberg picture operator, and then you uh, evolve it with time on the right-hand side, and then you anti-evolve it in time on the left-hand side. That's, in fact, the definition of what the Heisenberg, uh, what the Heisenberg picture is. Uh, or oh, I should say, so in fact, why, why do you need T0? Uh, T0 is the time where you define, you, you pick a time. There's no, this is completely arbitrary, right? But you pick a time uh, to decide when the Schrodinger picture and the Heisenberg picture will coincide. And so that's in fact sign off. So, so uh, Heisenberg picture uh, state, by definition, is the Schrodinger picture state, but at time t naught. Okay. So t naught is when Schrodinger equals the Heisenberg. All the operators are the same. The physical states are the same, and so on. Okay. Um, uh, uh, it, it's it's a it's a time that you pick uh, based on convenience, based on technical convenience. Right. There's no uh, in principle. There's no meaning to it. Okay. But because of this, uh, because of this definition, your eigen system necessarily would have to depend on time. Okay? So, um, we, will, we will talk about this in a little bit. But, uh, if your eigen system is such, you would find that your eigen, eigen state in the Heisenberg picture, in fact, any time evolves with time. Okay, so this is Heisenberg, and in the Schrodinger picture, this is what happens. Okay, um, and in fact. The way I always remember why we do what we do in the Heisenberg picture is through the expectation <coughs> value. Okay, so let me let me let me write it as a motivation. So if you if you wonder why the heck we are doing this, um, one way is to motivate it through uh, thinking about the expectation value. So think about expectation value. So in the Schrodinger picture, what we do is if you take a physical state and you want to know, let's say position or momentum or whatever it is, and you want to know on average, right? This is a quantum average, as I've explained to you guys before. Um, the expectation value is basically the quantum average of uh, the particular observable you're looking at. So uh, if you prepare many identical systems and let it evolve in time, and you make the observation repeatedly, uh, and you ask the question, how many, what are the outcomes that I will get? And on average, what is that outcome, right? On average, meaning you sum up all the experimental um, results that you get, and you average them. So that's this guy. So if you work this out, this is in fact, uh, this guy evolves in time. So I should now be careful. These are all short in the states. Um, and then this guy would, uh, anti evolve in time because it's a bra, so it's e to the i h t minus t naught. And then you have a Schrodinger here. So uh, what the Heisenberg picture does 
is that it preserves uh, the expectation value, meaning symbol for symbol. If you just replace uh, the cat for the cat, bra for the bra, and the operator for the operator, you would get the same thing. So what I mean is that if you replace the Schrodinger bra with the Heisenberg bra, and then you replace the uh, Schrodinger operator with the Heisenberg operator, and you replace the Schrodinger cat with the Heisenberg cat, you will find that this, this is equal to that. Why? Because this is in fact nothing <coughs> but, remember through this definition, the Heisenberg picture and the uh, 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 Schrodinger picture coincides exactly at the initial time. So this is in fact Schrodinger picture, uh, Heisenberg picture state. This is Heisenberg picture state. Okay, that's equal. And then this guy here uh, merely redefines what you mean by the operator. So, so actually the calculation is exactly the same, but you just group things together differently, right? And so this is what we call the Heisenberg picture operator. And that, that's why it's equal, right? So symbol for symbol, we have the same thing, but uh, um, um, uh, it's just a regrouping of the terms, right? So, so the final point that we should make is that the expectation value Uh, uh, is the same we replace uh, replace symbol for symbol basically the symbol let me put it in, in, in quotations symbol for symbol okay meaning you get uh, Heisenberg side Heisenberg A of T, and then Heisenberg Psi, right? And that's actually equal to um, Heisenberg Schrodinger, which now depends on time, Heisenberg operator, and then, uh, sorry, Schrodinger, okay? Um, one of the major applications I know about for showing the picture is that um, it uh, appeals to, um, or rather, it gets closer to what we know from quanta, uh, from classical mechanics. So, uh, as we'll see um, uh, with the with the um, with the uh, harmonic oscillator. So what usually will happen is that all the equations of motion will look the same. Uh, but except that uh, you do have to be careful that all the uh, uh, symbols that you see are now operators, right? So we'll see that. Um, and because of that, uh, this is why Heisenberg picture also shows up uh, quite prominently in quantum field theory. Right? So when you field theory, uh, what usually happens is that the equations that you know from classical field theory will carry over <coughs> to quantum field theory, but except that now your fields are operators. So let's in fact see that um, this is true in um, in the context of um, the harmonic oscillator. Actually, before I do that, let me just make one more remark, which is that um, uh, uh, let me just write it back. Okay. It, t it turns out, so the first thing you might ask is, what about the, uh, the Hamiltonian itself? And it turns out the Hamiltonian, uh, under this assumption that we are working with, which is that it doesn't depend on time, 
It turns out the Schrodinger picture, Heisenberg, uh, the uh, Hamiltonian, is the same as the Heisenberg picture, uh, uh, Hamiltonian. So symbol for symbol, you just replace one for the other, and it's the same thing. Uh, and so let's prove that first. Okay. So Heisenberg picture. Uh, uh, Hamiltonian, what is that? According to this definition, I have to anti-evolve the uh, uh, anti-evolution operator times the Schrodinger picture Hamiltonian times the evolution operator. Okay. So if you start with the Schrodinger picture, all of them commute. Because exactly because we assume that the Heisenberg, the Schrodinger picture Hamiltonian does not depend on time, right? So there are situations. Uh, next semester is is when we'll encounter them. If you turn on a uh, say a background uh, electric field or a background magnetic field, and you let these fields depend on time. Then you will discover that your short, your Hamiltonian will begin to depend on time, and then your eigenstates will depend on time. Then you have to be a little bit careful when you work out the uh, evolution operator. It's no longer it may no longer be just a simple exponential like that. And furthermore, the Hamiltonians at different times may not commute with each other anymore. So this is something to, to be very careful about. So this is why uh, usually when you're introduced to the Heisenberg picture, as we are doing right now, uh, we first start with the assumption that H is uh, time independent. And, and so, like I said, because it's time independent, they all commute. So you can bring this on the other side, and you see that this is just Hs. Okay, so symbol for symbol, you will see that the whole thing is in fact time independent, okay. Um, have you guys seen the Heisenberg picture? No? No? Heisenberg picture, no? Okay. All right. There's always the first time. Okay. So, um, good. So now let's, let's actually uh, work through it uh, for the um, simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, so the harmonic oscillator has Heisenberg picture, uh, uh, sorry, Hamiltonian is one half p squared plus omega squared over 2 x squared, okay? And um, what we're going to do is we're going to try to solve x for uh, the Heisenberg picture. Okay, so this is not trivial because why? Because you see this is equals to e to the i h t minus t naught and then uh, x e to the minus i h t minus t naught. Okay? Now if you think about this, this is Schrodinger picture. If you think about this, this has p squared and x squared. This one has p squared and, and, and m squared. So uh, what you, I think I've shown in the homework, uh, this is quite a while ago now, is that there is an infinite uh, nested commutator version of this uh, formula. If you have e to the i z, e to the minus i z, and you sandwich something, something in between, there's a nested commutator uh, 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 formula for that. But it's an infinite series. So you can, if you want, to try to work that out. Uh, but you'll find that that is uh, obviously very messy to do. So one way is to, in fact, try to different try to uh, uh, obtain a differential equation for this, uh, for this fellow. So, uh, so that's the question. 
can we get uh, a differential equation? So this is where, in fact, we can back up a little bit. So in fact, you notice that for Heisenberg picture operator, if I take i times dot of it, let's see how I wrote it in my notes. Um, no, I just took a dot, so let me just do that. So I take a dot of this. This is the dot of uh, u dagger a Schrodinger uh, u. Okay, so there are just two terms that I need to differentiate. I need to differentiate u dagger, and I need to differentiate u. So this is u dagger dot as u plus u dagger as u dot. Okay, so what is u? Remember u, the evolution operator itself uh, obeys the Schrodinger uh, equation. Remember this, okay? And so uh, uh, I can just multiply both sides by minus i, so I get that u dot itself is minus i h u, okay? And as long as as long as h is uh, time independent, I can swap the h and u. This is minus i u h as well, provided that h uh, uh, is T-independent, okay? Uh, it is not T-independent, there's, there's an H inside this guy, right, the exponential, uh, the exponential of H inside. So if they're not T-independent, then you may not always be able to commute H uh, with itself, right? But in this case, you can always do it because we're assuming that it does not depend on time. Uh, and likewise, u dagger dot, you can just take the adjoint on both sides and you get i h u uh, or i u h, I'm sorry, dagger. Okay. Again, because the h inside the u dagger uh, does not depend on time, so it commutes with h, so you are free to swap. Uh, H with U dagger, um, and therefore the order does not matter. Okay, so I say all this because now I can apply uh, this these two equations here. So U U dagger dot we just figured out is I times H times U dagger A S U, and U dagger A S U dot is given by minus i times u h, okay? And this is this is h times a Schrodinger, and this is a Schrodinger times h. So it's just basically the commutator of the Hamiltonian with the uh, Heisenberg picture a. So we can apply this to our um, uh, showing the picture operator in position, or rather, let me say that properly: the position operator in the Heisenberg picture. Any questions at this point? Thursday morning. Everybody is sleepy, right? I guess sleepy? Who is not sleepy? Me, I guess. I'm talking. I better not be sleepy. Thursday morning, it's very cold. It is cold. Oh, man. You haven't lived in Minnesota. You think it's cold? When I do you live in what, Canada or Minnesota or Alaska or some place like that? I think the worst place is Russia, right? It's, uh, the coldest 
the coldest city in the world, I think, inhabited city. Uh, not, don't, don't talk about Antarctica, but the, the, the coldest city in the world, I think it's somewhere in Russia. It gets to like minus 40, 50 degrees in, in Celsius, minus 40 degrees in the winter, I think. But Minnesota, where I lived for a couple of years, um, also gets down to minus 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah. So that's really cold, man. That's, oh man, no joke. Yeah. So um, let's try to use that equation, okay, and see what happens in the case of the um, position operator. So the position operator dot, according to that equation, in the Heisenberg picture, is now the Hamiltonian. Well, well, we know what the Hamiltonian The Hamiltonian is one half P squared. But it's a Hamiltonian in the Heisenberg picture. Remember, it doesn't matter which picture we use. But we can use the Heisenberg picture, so it will be P squared uh, of, of time. So, I mean, uh, instead, of keep, instead of having to uh, keep writing T, let me just write down H. Okay, just to remind us that this is now all in the Heisenberg picture because we want to solve for the Heisenberg picture P and X. And then we can write down something similar for, uh, actually, let, let, let's do one more step first. Okay, so this guy is uh, obviously going to commute with this guy because uh, they are the same thing. Anything commutes with itself. So the only thing that I have here is 1 i over 2 p h squared comma x h. Oh, one more thing, is that I should probably mention that um, this is very similar to the Poisson bracket in, uh, so, Uh, so, uh, if you have taken a slightly more advanced course in classical mechanics, uh, you would have been taught uh, the Hamiltonian and the Lagrangian formulation for uh, mechanics as well. Uh, actually, I am curious, how many people have taken such a course? Uh, have you taken a more advanced course in in classical mechanics, and you learn about Lagrangians and Hamiltonians and so on? You, you have taken, okay. So, uh, have you guys seen the Poisson bracket? Poisson bracket, okay, good. So this is a, sometimes how um, quantum mechanics is taught, right? They appeal, so at least that's what I hear, that's what the uh, uh, um, uh, inspired Dirac, for example, uh, what Dirac uh, did was he realized that uh, there's probably an analogy between the Poisson bracket in classical mechanics and the commutator in uh, quantum mechanics. And so this is actually it. Right? So I, I won't say much more because uh, you know, we, we, I think we know our formalism in quantum mechanics uh, pretty well by, by now. So. Uh, we don't have to uh, do too much analogy there, but uh, if you do look up uh, your book in classical mechanics, there will be a point where you talk about time evolution of uh, the classical observable. Uh, so classical observables are usually position, momentum, and so on, and the time evolution of those variables are, in fact, uh, described by the 
uh, Poisson bracket d, uh, the Poisson bracket with d uh, Hamiltonian, right? And so yeah, so even in classical mechanics, h is still the generator of time evolution. That's what um, that's what you should be familiar with. Okay, so this guy now is uh, remember there's a formula that tells you that this is I over two P H P H X H plus I over two P H X H pH. Okay, so basically you have A, B, C, uh, except that here A and B are the same pH, then you get A, B, C, and then you get B, C, uh, sorry, you get A, C, B. Okay, and so that's the formula that is easy to remember once you get used to it. Uh, and now, uh, the other thing we have to remember is that Commutation relations are preserved. Commutation relations are preserved. Under unitary transformations. It's not it's not even about going from Heisenberg to Schrodinger and back. So what do I mean by this? So if I have A commute with B and it's equal to C, okay, doesn't even, doesn't matter what, what the heck A, B, C are. If I define a new basis, A prime is U dagger A U, B prime is u dagger b u and c prime is u dagger c u. So this is just remember from our discussion of unitary operators, this is just a change of basis. So immediately I don't have to think. I can just write down a prime commuted with b prime has to give me c prime. This is what I mean by commutation relations are preserved under unitary transformations. But of course, let's prove it. Okay, so you start from the left hand side. This is nothing but uh, u dagger a u, this is a prime commuted with b, so times b, so u dagger b u, and then minus a swap with b. Okay, I don't have to write it again because it's, it's just the same thing. But now it's B and A for the second term. But what is this? This is firstly is identity. And this is in fact now uh, U dagger. And let me uh, write out the inside. A, B. And then there will be another term where you swap A, B. So you get B, A. And you get U outside. Because the U, da U, U dagger inside, sandwiched between them, cancels out and gives you identity. But this is nothing but a commutator of this is nothing but the commutator of A and B, which is of course C. But U dagger C U is exactly what you call let me let's just write it out. So U dagger C U is equals to C prime. Okay, so again, commutation relations are preserved under uh, unitary transformations. So immediately what it tells you, the reason why I want to say it here is because it's very general. And so this is a specific application of that. Once I know that that's true, then I can recognize that regardless of whether I have Heisenberg Px or Schrodinger Px, that must give me, that must give me minus i, right? So I get minus i times i is 1, so 1 half pH, plus that guy is also 1 half pH. So that's actually equals to simply 
TV. So this is one manifestation of what I mean by you recover classical mechanics. Right, so remember I, 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 uh, I have said the mass equals to one. So x dot of, uh, uh, in the Heisenberg picture, you should think of it as basically uh, the velocity. But when, when n is one, velocity is in fact momentum. Right, and that's exactly what we, what we have over here. x dot is equals to p. But it didn't come out of nowhere, right? It's not something that I, I just put in by hand, but it came out self-consistently from the Heisenberg equations of motion. These are the Heisenberg equations of motion right? from, from this guy. So now let's do the same thing for uh, uh, P dot, okay? P dot is what now? P dot is now the same game. I times the commutator, um, of the Hamiltonian same thing, but now commuted with P. Okay? And now what is that? This is now again P of course commutes with itself. So now I don't have to care about this term, but I have to now care about this term, which is I omega squared over two, and then uh, let's just go ahead and expand it out. So it's x h, x h p h plus x h. Oops, the other way. X h p h, x h. Okay, and x p is i, and x p is i. Again, remember what our discussion over there that commutation relations are. Uh, preserve under unitary transformations. So you basically get minus uh, uh, omega squared x h. Okay, I'm skipping a few steps. You combine them, you get 2 times i times x h, 2 times i, 2, two i times i over 2 is minus 1 times omega squared x h. Okay? And in fact, what is this? This is Newton's laws, right? If you think about this, this is Newton's laws because remember that uh, for, for the harmonic oscillator, if you write down Newton's laws for it, n a is just p dot because n is one. So acceleration is p dot. So p dot, uh, x double dot is x double dot plus omega squared x equals to zero. That's the simple harmonic oscillator equation, right? So in fact, we can make it very concrete because we know p is in fact x dot. So let, let's, let's write it out explicitly. p is x dot. So I can take one more dot. And so p dot is in fact x double dot. And not only that, we also know that uh, p dot is also minus uh, uh, the operator form x omega squared x h. Okay, so in fact, even though I appeal to the classical harmonic oscillator, right? We kind of know it because of the count. In fact, it's true. It's exactly true in the This is exactly true, even in a quantum domain, right? So this is the usual expectation. You, of course, you should work it out to be sure, but usually the uh, equations of motion in the Heisenberg picture uh, uh, look basically identical to the ones in classical mechanics. But of course, we have to remember that now we're dealing with operators. So these guys are operators and uh, not, not uh, just classical variables. But because we know how to solve this equation, we know the solution right away. 
xh of t, okay, remember, yes, uh, what's the boundary condition? The boundary condition is that xh, when uh, t equals to t naught, must give me the uh, Schrodinger picture uh, position operator. Uh, and also, we know that this is always true, right? So x, uh, I'm sorry, x h dot is always equal to p h. So therefore, x h dot at p naught must be in fact equal to p h at t naught. But that just means it's the Schrodinger picture momentum operator. So, uh, uh, in fact, you can check that the solution to this, well, we know the solution to this. The solution to this is a combination of sines and cosines, right? So this is, let me write it down in words first. It's a linear combination of sine omega t minus t, t naught, and cosine of omega t minus t naught, okay? Uh, or, or exponentials, or exponential of plus minus i omega t minus t naught. If you use the exponential, then you have to make sure that um, uh, it still is permission. Right, but because this guy is formation. But sine and cosine immediately gets these are real functions. So 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 you just want to make sure that the coefficients are formation. But if you use exponentials, it's a little sometimes it's a bit tricky to make sure that. But here we go. Okay, so so what we see is that because sine will vanish, so I have to go a few more minutes because I, I was late. So sine will vanish when t is equal to t naught. And cosine will become 1 when t equals to t dot. So that suggests that the cosine term must be, uh, must have x as the coefficient, and the sine term must have p as the coefficient, right? So let's guess. So x Schrodinger times uh, cosine of omega t minus t naught, okay? And then plus, um, let's see, p s and then sine omega minus t minus t naught over omega. Okay, and let's check. Let's check that this is in fact true. Right. So I hope the classical part uh, we don't have to check. Right. If you just take double dot plus omega squared. You can check easily that it satisfies the right equation. Um, but let's check that the boundary conditions are, in fact, satisfied. So when t equals to t naught, x h goes to, like I said, this will vanish, and cosine will goes, goes to 1. And so, in fact, of course, Heisenberg equals to Schrodinger in that limit. Uh, but when you take the dot of that guy, then what happens is that cosine becomes minus sine, and minus sine becomes zero in the limit where t equals t naught. And then x dot, uh, 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 sorry, uh, the p term has a sine, but when you differentiate it, you become omega times cosine. So the omegas cancel, and the cosine will go to one. And therefore, in fact, uh, it satisfies the boundary conditions that we have. Uh, we know we must recover. Okay, and that's in fact uh, the solution. The solution of um, the Heisenberg picture uh, position uh, operator in terms of the uh, Schrodinger picture. And once you have this, you can also, you can right away get p, right? Because we know that x dot is p. So let's also write that down. And um, so 
see what we what we get. Okay, so p of h is simply x h dot, and this is just given by uh, minus omega x Schrodinger times sine of omega t minus t dot. Okay, and then uh, uh, sine becomes cosine, and the omegas cancel out. So you get plus p s times cosine of omega t minus t naught. Okay, and that is the solution for the Heisenberg picture momentum operator. So one immediate application is that now you can see that if you are, if you have a uh, if you have a, a, a physical state and you want to know how do you calculate the mean position for example okay i want to know what's the mean position of my uh, particle and well there are two ways to calculate this one is to first evolve my wave function in time and then if I have the expression in general uh, as a function of time then I can just uh, uh, take the inner product and do the integral right but now I have a different way uh, and, and it's only when you see the solution that you see how different it is the different way is to simply take the initial Uh, I say initial in the Schrodinger picture, that's in the Schrodinger picture, but that's actually the Heisenberg. That's in fact the Heisenberg picture operator, uh, the Heisenberg picture state. And, but instead of evolving in time, the state and the, and the bra, now I have the time-dependent solution for the position. So instead of evolving these guys in time, I can instead evolve the x in time, so to speak, right? By con converting x a, x s to x h. That's basically what I'm doing. So all I have to do is x s cosine of omega t minus t naught, and then plus p s sine of omega t minus t naught. And all I have to do is calculate the initial position and the initial momentum uh, uh, expectation value. Right? So the calculation is different now uh, because I have solved the Heisenberg picture operators. So I know how the time evolution goes. The, so all I need to do, as far as the expectation value is concerned, is I just need to calculate the initial uh, expectation values, and then the time evolution has already been taken care of. Right. So you see that the slight, even though the answer, the final answer is the same, of course, uh, whether you evolve the state and then do expectation value, or you use the, use the initial expectation values, and then multiply it by the uh, take the appropriate linear com linear combinations that depend on time. Uh, they both obviously have to give you the same answer, but uh, the calculation is different. Okay, and so depending on uh, depending on your uh, uh, problem, sometimes one can be easier than the other. So it's always very good to know more than one way to do things. Right. Mm. So, so uh, uh, that's something important to keep in mind. Right. Uh, for the same piece of physics, it's always good to know more than one way. In fact, as many ways as you can to do exactly the same thing, because the same different methods that you know could be less or more useful in other circumstances. Right, and so the tool, the more tools that you acquire, uh, you become more versatile. You are able to solve more problems. Uh, so this Heisenberg, Schrodinger is 
uh, conversion is one example of that. Okay, any questions for me? So since yeah. Uh, yeah. phi t naught and x s and t s are in between now time, then I can uh, this guy is right. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can uh -huh. move the cosine and sine yeah. all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. That's what I said in words, right? Which is that sine x sine. Uh, the cosine doesn't take part in the integration, right? So these guys is just the initial wave function uh, expectation value uh, of of the position, and this guy is the expectation value of the position. That's right. Yeah. So the calculation is now a bit different. Any so, other questions? So do they yeah. derive to the, the exact same uh -huh. uh, result on mm -hmm. there should be a small deviation? No, no, no. Uh, this guy is exactly the same as this. Right? So like I said, it's a, it's, it, it better be the same. So it's the same, uh, same answer, but the formalism is a little bit different. Right? One is you evolve the operator in time first, then you take the expectation value. The other one is you evolve the states and the graphs in time first, then you take the expectation value. But they have to give you the same, exactly the same answer. Yeah. So keep that in mind. I mean, sometimes one way, uh, that's the point of introducing this Heisenberg picture. Sometimes one way is easier than the others. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See you guys next week.